yeah, welcome to Ministry Without a Puppet. This is a very crucial um, session, very crucial concept, biblical concept, kingdom concept, a concept that I believe, you know, the Lord really wants us to connect to and be able to um, um, release to all the earth because this is something that uh, we, we are not going to necessarily just uh, you know, hear about or learn about. This is something that we're supposed to put into action. So we've called this program, it's in a sense, in, in every sense, a movement, um, a movement of ministry without a pulpit. This is, like I said last time, this is not something that is strictly for uh, people who are actually involved in ministry right now. This is something, a movement that is mandated for each one of us, a movement that is mandated for all of us, something that we're supposed to do in our various uh, fields of influence, in our various fields of influence. So I am so happy that um, everybody managed to connect. So I'm not going to waste any more time because I delayed to um to to come through online today i just want to get straight to the point so one of the things that i mentioned last week that is very important for us to connect to this idea of ministry without a pulpit is the idea of appreciating that this whole program helps us it it brings us to our attention it brings us to complete awareness and helps us to appreciate the obligation that we have as children of god the obligation of becoming a move of God. So ministry without a pulpit is a movement that is open to everybody who is born again. You are called to be a move of God in whatever place that you are residing in, in whatever field that you're operating in. God expects you. God is literally waiting for you to manifest as a, a part of his move, as a part of his influence, as a part of his power, as a part of his glory in whatever area that you are called in. So ministry without a pulpit helps us to appreciate and understand the mandate that God has put in place for each individual who is born again, each individual who is a son and a daughter of God, each individual who is born of Christ, each individual has been called to do the work of ministry. Last week, we looked into a scripture uh, from the book of 2 Corinthians, and we appreciated, I believe, that scripture that helps us to appreciate the idea of ministry of reconciliation. So uh, let's proceed and see what we can learn through today's session. Right. So I want to first off um, try to help us appreciate and understand the definition of what ministry without a pulpit is all about. So what is it all about? What is ministry without a pulpit? Because I saw so many people were excited about the concept of just seeing that it's called ministry without a pulpit, but not everybody really gets to um, appreciate and connect with the representation of what it is all about. What is ministry without a pulpit? Remember, I'm saying this is ministry that literally everybody who is born of Christ, literally everyone who is called by God, everybody is called to do this ministry. So what is ministry without a, a pulpit? Ministry without a pulpit is the responsibility of the reconciliation of the world back to God. It is our responsibility. Our responsibility as Christians, our responsibility as children of God, our responsibility of reconciling the world back to God. And if you remember, last week we shared a scripture from the book of 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter number 5, from verse 18. I'll just read it quickly. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So the ministry of reconciliation is something that God has given us, mandated us. It is something that God has set for us to put into motion. Last week I mentioned that many of us are called for ministry, but very few of us really come to the point of appreciating that the ministry that we have been called for and Please not, just bear with me, Take uh, walk with me so that you can have a clear understanding of what this is all about. It is not what you are assuming. So just, just you know, bear with me and walk with me so that I can bring 
um, uh, you know, some perspective to what I mean when I'm talking about ministry without a pulpit. It's the responsibility of the reconciliation of the world back to God, according to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 from verse 18, 19, and even 20. So we appreciate that as children of God, we are mandated. We were given the ministry of reconciliation by God as a responsibility, as a responsibility to ensure that the world is reconciled back to him. Now, another way of understanding what ministry without a pulpit is all about is we can say it is the work of activating God's mandate in a place or field. It is the work of activating. Now, when we're talking about activating, this is definitely a mandate that you have, a mandate that I have as a child of God. A work of activating, meaning that I'm doing it intentionally and I'm, I'm doing it with all consciousness. I am activating God's mandate in a place, whatever place I am in as a child of God. I am supposed to activate God's mandate. Whatever field I am in as a child of God, whatever field I am serving in, working in, whatever field that I am building or cultivating my career in, whatever field that I am functioning in as a child of God, I'm expected to activate God's mandate. And please note when we're talking about activating God's mandate, it is not necessarily um, a particular talk of, um, you going about in that in your workplace with with the Bible and preaching the Word of God. It is not literally that. In as much as if you have an opportunity to do so, to share your faith and share the Word of God with people that you work with, you must do that. But then activating God's mandate is not necessarily about preaching the gospel. Activating God's mandate is ensuring that the mind of God, the definition of a field, the definition of a specific thing could, it, could, could be the marketplace, the definition of business, it could be uh, government, the definition of governance, of government in itself. It could be, you know, whatever you can think of, whatever you can have in mind. Every one of those things or places that you are operating and functioning in, you are expected to activate God's mandate in that place and activate God's mandate in the field that you're functioning in. And I'm going to elaborate as we go through uh, this series of teachings. Um, when we're talking of ministry without a pulpit, we're talking about the expression of God's mind. The expression of God's mind, the expression of God's personality and the expression of God's power beyond the pulpit. Now, so this is one of the things I mentioned last week, and I did mention that the challenge that we have in the body of Christ is that we have defined the function of a child of God to being things that he or she is supposed to do by the pulpit. If an individual says, I am called for ministry, every time we think of pulpit ministry, if an individual says, I believe God is calling me to uh, function or work in ministry, we always think about preaching by the pulpit. Yet ministry, like I explained last week, I explained that ministry is in different sections. There is ministry by the pulpit, of course, and it's very important. It's very crucial. But there's also ministry before the pulpit, and there is ministry beyond the pulpit. So when we're talking, most importantly, when we're talking of ministry without a pulpit, in as much as there is an idea or there's a connection to it with ministry before the pulpit, but we need to appreciate that the most of ministry without a pulpit is doing the work of ministry beyond the pulpit. It goes beyond preaching a sermon. It goes beyond teaching a concept. It is now activating the mandate that God has for a city, activating it in that city. It, is, it goes beyond the pulpit to the extent of ensuring that God's mandate for a specific field, industry, or sector, God's mandate is activated in that sector. It goes beyond the idea of what we do in, in, you know, in the confinement of the four walls, four walls of the church building. It is when we are thinking beyond a sermon. 
It is when we want to establish the move of God. It is when we, are, we want to establish the mind of God. It is when we want to establish the purpose and the uh, mission and the vision of God in a certain place or in a specific area. So it expresses God's mind, God's thoughts. Ministry without a pulpit expresses God's ideas. It expresses God's personality and even his power beyond the pulpit in whatever area or field or, or area of field or area of function or even place that you're situated. That's the idea of ministry without a pulpit. So it is not something that you can actually say it is it is work for pastors or it is work for people called in the fivefold ministry. No. Ministry without a pulpit, it, it, is, it is work that is established for everyone who's called to be a child of God. It is a ministry that is given to you the moment you are born again, you are given that responsibility that now you are set to cultivate your salvation, cultivate the gifts that you have, the gifts that you are receiving or the gifts that you are even yet to receive. Make sure that you put them into use to ensure that God's mandate, God's expression of thoughts and personality and even power is established in every area that you go in. Let's look at the fourth example of what ministry without a pulpit is. It is the work of stewardship as expressed by the sons and daughters of God. Ministry without a pulpit is the expression uh, of the work of stewardship by the sons and daughters of God. You and I have been given um, gifts. We are gifted in different ways. We are gifted. You are gifted and I am gifted. Uh, at the same time, you have a, a level of grace that you have in your upon your life. And I also have a level of grace that I have upon, upon my life. You are anointed for certain things the, the way that I'm also anointed for certain things. Now, it, both of us, the one who's listening to me right now, or the people who are listening to me right now, we all have the, the, the presence of the kingdom inside of us. God resides in us. We have the power of the greater one who, who resides inside of us as we also reside in him. Now, all of that that we have, the gifts, the anointing, the abilities, the power, the presence in itself, all of that that we have within us, that is, those are things, those are elements that we are expected to steward as children of God. We are expected to steward those things and express be it our anointing in any place that we find ourselves, where there is a situation, where there is a challenge, where there is a problem, as a child of God, you are expected to express something that is within you, a gift, a power, an anointing, the grace upon your life to bring forth solutions. That's the kind of lifestyle that Jesus, you know, lived here on earth. He, he's, he was a great steward of what was inside of him. He was a great steward of the presence. He was a great steward of the power. He was a great steward of the anointing upon his life. And you could see the expression of what was inside of him, bringing solutions in people's lives, bringing solutions, bringing understanding to things that people could not understand, things that people struggled to comprehend. The anointing that Jesus had before it was expressed out there, before it manifested out there, one thing that you're supposed to appreciate is it was well stewarded. He was a great steward. He knew how to uh, steward what was inside of him. He knew how to steward what was inside of him. So when we're talking of ministry without a pulpit, we're talking about the work of stewardship, how you are able to steward what is inside of you, the power, the grace, the anointing that is inside of you, and you are able to express it in any area that you find yourself in or that you find yourself called to. The fifth example that helps us to understand what ministry without a pulpit is, is that ministry without a pulpit is the activation of, God, of kingdom culture. I almost said of God culture, right? It's almost the same. But activation of kingdom culture. It is the activation of kingdom culture. Now, kingdom culture is important because kingdom culture highly relies on 
values, the values that um, you know we find in in the world of the kingdom, in the heaven, in the heavenlies, the values of God, the values of Jesus Christ, the values of the Holy Spirit. Those values, and at the end of the day, they shape what we call kingdom culture. Now, that kingdom culture is expected once again to be activated. It does not activate itself. It is not activated by God himself, but it is activated by you and me. So when we're talking of ministry without a pulpit, we are talking about our functionality in ensuring that all these five things amongst many get to be activated in the places we find ourselves in, in the field of work we find ourselves in. So what are we talking about? We're supposed to take the responsibility of the ministry of reconciliation, of reconciling the world back to God. And as we do so, we need to ensure that the mandate of God is activated in every place and in every field that we find ourselves in. We need to ensure that as we are activating God's mandate, we are expressing his mind, expressing his personality, expressing his power beyond what we just do in church. And we also need to ensure that we are stewarding what he has given us and we get to express what he has given us as his sons and his daughters. And in, in, in that whole process, or finally, or not necessarily finally, but in that whole process, we need to also make sure that we activate what is called kingdom culture. So this is what without a, a pulpit is all about, ministry without a pulpit. It is ministry that ensures that you don't function in restriction. It is ministry that every child of God, every born again child of God should live by, should uh, function by. It is the kind of ministry that is expected to be your lifestyle. It is the kind of ministry that if you want to try to define your calling or to define your purpose, this is the, the starting ground where you say, okay, I am called to do ministry without a pulpit. Why? Because you understand that you have been given minist the ministry of reconciliation. You understand that you are saved to serve. I remember last week we talked about in the book of Mark chapter number one, how everybody who had an encounter with Jesus Christ was prompted to do something. We saw some being prompted to follow him, which is the aspect of discipleship. We saw some being prompted to serve him. And serving God can happen in the church, like the four walls, as we define church, uh, in the church building. Or you can even serve God outside of church, which is ministry beyond the pulpit. But at the same time, we saw even some who were prompted to spread the news about what he was doing, what Jesus Christ was doing, or what Jesus Christ had, had done for them, which is the preaching of the word. So we are called to serve in some capacity every time we have an encounter. And it's not a once-off thing because salvation is a process in itself. Yes, you are saved at a moment, but after when you are saved, there is the working of your salvation. There is the process of ensuring that you grow closer, you get to understand Christ even more. And in that whole process, you are, express, you are experiencing and, and discovering several areas of salvation that Christ saved you. Now, in, in, in all that process, the idea of the matter is this. You will be prompted every moment you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, you will be prompted to do something for the kingdom. You will be prompted to do something pertaining to his mandate. You will be prompted to take a step towards becoming a move of God. I hope you're getting this and I hope you are, are connecting to this. Now, having said all of this, I have, I have yet another quote from General William Booth for those who don't know, General William Booth, I explained last time that he's the uh, co-founder of what we know today as the Salvation Army. And he was a great man of God, someone who was aggressive when it came to the Great Commission, someone who was so aggressive, aggressive when it came to evangelism and even describing the function of evangelism. So there's a great quote. I shared another one last week, but today I have another one that I want to share with you. And in as much as it's, it's quite lengthy, we're going to focus on one part of what he said. General William Booth said, not cold, did you say? 
and I want you to, to connect with the context here. Remember, we talked of what ministry without a pulpit is, all of these elements. And I'm saying your understanding of all these elements, in, it, it helps you to step into the work of ministry. Now, if you still believe that maybe you are born again, you're a child of God, but you're not called for ministry, and remember, I'm not talking about starting a church. Remember, I'm not talking about even uh, preaching be behind the pulpit or by the pulpit. I'm not talking about that. I am talking about the, the sole responsibility of reconciling your world back to God. The sole responsibility of reconciling your field back to God. Now, if you think you're not called, General William Booth said, not called, did you say? Not heard the call, I think you should say. Put your ear down to the Bible and hear him bid you to uh, go and pull sinners out of the fire of sin. Put your ear down to the burdened, agonized heart of humanity and listen to its pitiful well for hell. Go stand by the gates of hell and hear the damned entreat you to go to their father's house and bid their brothers and sisters and servants and masters not to come there. And then look Christ in the face whose mercy you have professed to obey and tell him whether you will join heart and soul and body and circumstances in the march to publish his mercy to the world. My God, what a court, what a statement. I just love General William Booth. You see, this, this quote is a quote written by somebody who understood that ministry is not something that is just, that is uh, a work that is called for a few. It is ministry by its nature. It is kingdom work that every person who is part of the kingdom should function in. Ministry work is kingdom work that every individual who is a part of the kingdom should function in. That is why we are saying each one of us has a ministry. Each one of us is expected to function in ministry. So General William Booth is arguing the fact that you think you are not called. If you think you're not called, then first thing that you need to do is to put your ear down to the Bible. Listen to what scripture says. Read the Bible. Listen to what scripture says. When you read the Bible, you will realize that you, th there's a point where Jesus bid you to go and pull sinners out of the fire of sin. If you listen to what scripture is literally saying, you will realize that there's a point in scripture where you are sent, where you are mandated to follow through the work of God. If you think you're not called, even after reading the scripture, then maybe go down to the people in your community that are burdened, people in your city that are agonized, people in your city that are wailing for help, calling for help, asking if there is any God out there, asking if there is any solution to the, to the struggles and the challenges that they are facing in their lives. If, if you read the scripture and you don't see yourself called. And if you go to your city and go to the people in your community and listen to their cries of help and still think you're not called, then maybe try to take a trip to go to hell. Stand by the gates of hell and then hear the wailing and the cries of those who are in hell crying out for you who has an opportunity to go and do the work of ministry, to go and tell their father's house be their brothers, their sisters, the servants and the masters in their household not to come there. The people in hell will ask you, will be the ones who will send you. If you think God has not sent you, if you think God has not called you for ministry, if you think God has not called you for what we're talking about here, of having the responsibility of reconciliation, if you think God has not called you to activate his mandate in your field or in whatever place you find yourself in, if you think God has, does not require you or has not required you to express his mind, his personality, and his power beyond the pulpit, if you think God has not given you a, a, a responsibility to steward the gifts, the anointing, and the grace upon your life, if you think God has not given you a responsibility to activate the kingdom culture, then you are not reading scripture. 
then you have not listened to the wailing of people in your community. Then you possibly have never taken a trip to hell or ever heard about the circumstances in hell and even imagined what the people in hell would request you to do. Maybe those are the people that should send you. Maybe those are the people that should send you. But, but nonetheless, reading the scripture, listening to people's challenges, and even taking a trip to hell, if all that does not work, maybe try to face Jesus in your, in, in your um, secret, sec, um, I mean, in, in your um, um, quiet time, whilst you are in the secret place, whilst you are in, the, in prayer, try to look at Jesus Christ in the face and tell him whether you will join heart and soul and body and circumstances in the mandate of ministry or you will not. Either, one, either case, you're going to find yourself appreciating that one way or the other, I have been called for ministry. And please note once again, I'm not saying you're called to be a pastor. I'm not saying you're called to be an apostle. I'm not saying you're called to be a prophet. Neither am I saying you're called to be an evangelist or a teacher. I am saying you're called for ministry. Why? Because scripture says we've been given the, the, the responsibility of uh, uh, reconciling the world back to God, just as Christ was given that responsibility. And to us, it was given as the ministry of reconciliation. So my effort and your effort is expected to contribute to what is God's mandate, which is reconciling the whole world back to him. And please notice, it is not talking about just people. It says the world. The world encompasses more than people. The world encompasses of systems. The world encompasses of um, uh, fields of work, industries, sectors. The world encompasses of much more than just human beings. Even nature in itself, the earth in itself, every little thing that you can think of is encompassed when you're talking about the world. So there is a lot that is in what we call the world. I want to make an emphasis on this part of um, um, General William uh, Booth Scott. He said, not called, did you say? Not heard the call, I think you should say. Put your ear down to the burdened, agonized heart of humanity and listen to its pitiful well for help. Now, this is, this is the part I believe for today, I want to make a bit of an emphasis. Because I believe each one of us, for everybody who is logged on right now, there is a, a, a level of consciousness that you have each and every day when you are watching news or reading the newspaper. Every time when you are hearing about what is happening in your community, in your city, or in your nation, you can agree with me that our cities, our neighborhoods, our, our communities, our villages, our regions and nations, you know, our places of abode are ill. People are experiencing burdens. People are in struggles. People are facing challenges. People are, are in pitiful situations and circumstances, challenges that are agonizing their hearts, problems that they can't just come out of. I believe even today, if you read your newspaper from the front page to whatever page you read it through, one way or the other, there is something that caught your attention, a problem that people are facing, some, um, some, some situation in your community. It could be the, the, the unfortunate um, happenings of rape cases. It could be the unfortunate happenings of murders, of robberies. It could be the, 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 the struggling and the wailing of people in poverty. Any challenges that you You've, you've actually uh, you know, paid attention to. It could be in your newspapers, in whatever city you're based in. It could be even in your radio news or TV news or your neighbor telling you about what is happening to another neighbor or your neighbor telling you about what is happening to a relative of them who is in another city. Whatever that you had that expresses the pressure and the challenges that human beings are going through is an indicator that you and I are not doing our work as we are called to do our work. I'm telling you the truth. Every time you read the paper, 
Every time you hear of a story of people struggling, people uh, fighting, people in war, people crying, people, uh, you know, agonized in one way or another, every time you see any, any of such a story, it's an indicator that there is a possibility that there is a man or a woman of God, a man or a woman called by God for ministry, not necessarily ministry by the pulpit, but to change the, tra the, the, the trajectory of, of people in that community, to change the circumstances that people are going through in that place. There's a person who has been called to transform a city, a nation, a village who did not make an effort because that calling, they felt that it, is, it seems like it's a calling aligned to God's purpose, but because they feel it is not necessarily supposed to be, it's not necessarily ministry within the church, they neglected it because they wanted to pursue for ministry by the pulpit. People have neglected their purpose. People have neglected their calling for ministry beyond the pulpit, ministry without a pulpit, because they have never had an understanding of the definition of what ministry is all about. So our cities, our villages are wailing right now. They are crying. There's a scripture that I want you to read with me in Proverbs, um, in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 11, verse number 10. I want you to I want you to connect with this and appreciate this. And I, I want to welcome everybody who's logged in. I can see that there are a, a couple of people that are logged in right now and watching. Welcome, welcome everybody. Let's, let's look into Proverbs 11, verse number 10. My God, ministry without a pulpit, the kind of ministry that you and I are called for. Even if you're called for ministry by the pulpit, God expects you to function even greater in ministry without a pulpit. Even if you're called to be a CEO, even if you're called to be in the marketplace, you are still called to express and establish God's mandate in there. I'm not saying preach to your employees, no. I'm not saying uh, open scripture every time you want to make a decision. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that's bad, but I'm not, I'm not saying that's what ministry without a pulpit is all about. Ministry without a pulpit is about establishing God's mandate and his standards and several other things I mentioned earlier. Verse number 10 of Proverbs chapter number 11 reads, when in this version I'm using, it says, when it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. From another version that I have, uh, which, which is the HCSB, it reads, um, when the righteous thrive, a city rejoices. And when the wicked die, there is a joyful shouting. Now, that phrase, when the righteous thrive, the city rejoices. The first part of verse number 10. I want you to appreciate and understand what it, what it speaks of, especially in our generation. You see, the problem that we have right now is that most of our people in the communities and cities are wailing and they are crying. It's happening in this nation that I am in. It is happening in the whole of Southern Africa. It is happening in the whole of Africa. It is happening globally. Each one of our countries, there are people struggling. There are people living in poverty. There are people struggling with life. There are people being abused day in and day out in their households, in their families, by the people that are close to them. There are people being abused sexually. There are people are being, being abused you know, violently. There are people being abused in all sorts of manners that we can think of. There are people being taken for granted, being uh, exposed to danger, some being murdered literally by gunpoint. We have several cases of people being killed by gunpoint in this nation. And I believe even in your nation, I believe even in your city, there are people killing each other one way or another. There are people who are struggling to live life according to righteousness. Now, why do you think there's an experience of such a thing? I'll tell you the answer. According to Proverbs chapter number 11, verse number 10, the city only gets to rejoice if the righteous thrive. If righteous people are thriving, then the city will rejoice. My city is not rejoicing, I can tell you for sure. Just a week ago, just a week ago, there is a case of people who were shot gunpoint, just like that, their lives ended. It, the whole story entails of a lot of things that was happening, which, ex, which to me shows that 
as the body of Christ, as children of God, we are not doing as much as we are supposed to. There are so many cases besides murders. There are cases of corruption, fraudulent activities that are destroying people's lives. There are cases of businesses that are literally killing people, bringing problems to people's lives, not necessarily solutions as they are supposed to. And all those challenges are an indicator of the state of our cities, the state of my city, the state of your city. And I am saying our cities are not in joy. Our cities are not joyful. The people living in our cities are crying. The people living in our countries are crying. Question is, why are they crying? Proverbs 11 verse 10 has the answer. It says, if the righteous strive, then the city rejoices. So if the city is not rejoicing, literally it means the righteous are not thriving. Does it mean thriving by buying a brand new car? No. Does it mean thriving by buying a brand new house, building a brand new house? No. That's not the kind of thriving that we're talking about. We are talking about thriving in our righteousness. Many of us righteous people are not thriving in our righteousness. We are not living out the mandates that God has given us. We are not expressing God's mind, God's personality, and God's power in our fields and in our places of abode. We are not expressing God's mandate or activating, rather, God's mandate or activating kingdom culture in every place we are found. Why? Because we think we are not supposed to play a role in that. Now, I am telling you, you and I have a role to play. The challenges that we're seeing in our cities, the problems that people are crying about day in and day out. Many of us, many countries, we are always complaining about problems that are 20 year old, 20, 20 year old problems right now. We are crying about economic uh, challenges that we've been facing for 30, 40, 50 years, or even, even less, even if it's five years or 10 years. Many of us are crying because of several social ills that we are experiencing. Many of those challenges affecting us directly. Some are not affecting us directly, but they are affecting the people who live around us. People are in crisis right now. There are so many crises that are affecting people in our communities, not just the, 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 the COVID pandemic. There, is, there are challenges that we have here in Africa. Now, those problems that we are facing here in Africa, I am saying that the problem of a nation is an expression of problems at city level. The problems at city level are an expression of problems at community or village level. Why is it like that? It's because the righteous people are not thriving in their righteousness. You and I are not thriving in our righteousness. God has graced us. God has anointed us. God has gifted us. God has empowered us. God has given us all authority. God has given us power that we can use to change our communities. But we are not doing so because we have become part of the world. Literally, we have become part of the problem. We are expected by God's mandate to reconcile the world, the systems of the world, to reconcile industries and fields back to God, back to his mandate. And when we're talking about reconciling the systems of the world and even the fields that we work in back to God, we are talking about re bringing those things back to the original definition of function. We are talking about bringing those things back to the original state of standards, godly standards. What, how does God define government? How does God define business? How does God define education? How does God define health or hospitality, whatever you can think of? Now, all those things are right now detached from God. Governments are detached from God. Businesses are detached from God. Educational systems are detached from God. Economical systems in our nations and cities are all detached from God. Question is, why? And the simple answer is this. The righteous people are not thriving in their righteousness. They have become 
part of the problem. You might say, no, Bevan, I don't do that. I don't participate in any corruption. I don't participate in anything that brings people down, that brings life, the lives of people down. I don't participate in anything that actually inconveniences the person next to me. I, you might say that, and I might believe you, that you don't participate in it in that way, that you're not corrupt yourself, right? I might believe that you're not corrupt yourself. I might believe that you're not a greedy person. I might believe that you're not a person who is, you know, um, um, conceptualizing ideas that will destroy other people's lives. I might believe you from that perspective, but the big question is this. This is the big question. What are you doing to ensure that whatever that is hurting and destroying other people's lives comes to a stop? What are you doing pertaining to stopping the work of the devil? Some people are participating in the work of the enemy, in the work of the devil. Because scripture tells us that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. People's lives are being destroyed day in and day out. People are being robbed of the prosperity that God has, has set for them in their communities, cities, and nations. People's future is being stolen each and every day, each and every time. People's lives are being stolen. People's future opportunities are being stolen. People's jobs are being stolen. Why? Simple. You and I are not thriving in our righteousness. If the moment, and I want to take you back to this, the moment we thrive in our righteousness, guess what will happen? We will activate God's mandate in our place, in our field we will start to express God's mind, God's personality, and God's power. We will start to activate kingdom culture in our world. And the moment we start to activate that, the moment we start to work in line with that, that's the very moment that we'll start to see a change happening in our cities. That's the very moment that we'll start to see a change happening in our nations. That's the very moment that we'll start to see us literally living out our lives as the salt of the earth, as the light of the world, because that's what we've been called for. We've been called to be the salt of the earth, but are we being the salt of the earth right now? We've been called to be the light of the world. What light are we shining right now? People are living in darkness. People are struggling in life. People are doubting the existence of God because the children of God are quiet, are idle, and literally just drawing back not expressing themselves according to God's mandate. Where we are expected to influence the earth, we are, we, 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 it seems like we have no flavor. It seems like there's no influence that we can bring. Where we are expected to shine our light, we, we hide under the table. We don't want to come out in the open, in the open and express God's, God's values and culture. We don't want to come out and, 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 and stand and, and rather, let me put it this way, and express our moral obligation. We don't want to do that. We would rather just stand by the sidewalk and watch as things happen, watch as people die. Have you ever noticed that in the past 12 months, it's possible that there is little that you have done is expected of you according to the definition of salt in the earth. Have you ever noticed that in the past 12 months, and let's even just say six months of this year of 2020, possibly there's very little that you have done as expected of you as the light of the world. Oh yes, you might have read a lot of scripture. Oh yes, you might have prayed quite a number of times and fasted quite a number of times. And as you were doing that, you were doing a great thing. Something was working inside of you. Something has been growing inside of you. A greater level of anointing, a greater level of grace, a greater level of understanding the ways of God. But the question is after understanding, after connecting to that dunamis, 
after connecting to that anointing, after connecting to that level of grace, what have you done? How have you gone out beyond the pulpit, if ever you are doing anything by the pulpit? How have you gone out to be an ambassador of God in your field? How have you gone out to establish God's will on the earth? My God, we need to think about this. We need to think about it and understand what our role is. What is your role? What is your role? Every time you identify an area that is sick, an area that is ill, an area where there are challenges, do you know what your role is? And I'm not saying every area. There is an area you have been called for. Many of you know it, but many of you are silent, are ignorant. Uh, maybe let me say, many of you are scared to even get into it. Many of us are not aligned to the mission of God. So we are living our lives in the wrongful way. And I'm not talking about, like, I'm not just talking about sin here. I'm talking about not living our lives according to the purpose that God has set for us. So will you commit yourself to minister where your ministry is needed? Will you make it a mandate to identify the area of concern in your city? Will you make it a mandate to identify an area of concern in your community, in your field of work? Even if you can't identify it, will you try to make it a mandate and even at least pray about it and ask the Lord, Lord, open my eyes to see the areas where people are burdened, where humanity is agonized, and where people are wailing and crying for help. Help me to see those places. Help me to identify those places because I want to become a move of God. Ladies and gentlemen, God is not going to just move. Many of us are holding him back. We are drawing back his intentions because we are scared ourselves. We are afraid ourselves. We don't see the necessity of transforming our communities and cities according to God's mandate. We don't see the necessity of doing that. But the moment we see it, that's the very moment we are going to appreciate ministry without a pulpit. Because that is what it's all about. It is not about you know doing things just restricted by the four walls of the church yes i want to go back to church yes i want to go back and you know praise the lord in a corporate setting but what i believe according to the inspired thoughts i've had and the voice of the holy spirit that i have had from last year Ministry, definitely, as you can see now, ministry is no longer going to be the way that we've always known of having a one person, one individual, one individual who has the responsibility of doing the work of ministry in a group of 100 people. No. It might be so as we are all in one place listening or being taught. But when it comes to the impact of the church, each one of us, has to take up the responsibility of ministry and reconcile the world back to God. I do hope today you learned something that is quite interesting. I hope you connected with the sole idea that I was trying to drive home, that you and I, we are supposed to be a move of God. And the reason why our cities and communities are wailing and struggling. The reason why God's mandate is not well established in our fields, in our locations, in our cities and nations 
is because you and I have not taken up the ministry that God has called us for. And that's ministry without a pulpit. Now may God bless you and be with you throughout this whole week. I pray that you just share this with somebody that you know needs to hear this. Share the link with somebody who needs to hear this. Somebody who needs to have their mind opened. And next week again, we're going to have another session, same time on Sunday, 6 p.m. on this page to help us appreciate and understand our role because it is all about us playing our role. You and I have a role to play in the cities and communities that we live in. You and I have a role to play in the kingdom of God. You and I are expected to be a move of God. God bless you and God be with you throughout this whole week. Make time to uh, link up with us if there's anything that you would want to inquire or anything that you'd want to, you know, um, even contribute to this in terms of ideas or in terms of questions so that, you know, we make sure that all those questions and ideas, we put them together and still present them for people to know exactly how they can live this kind of life. God bless you and God be with you. Enjoy your week.